Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we are here before you today, re-echoing and reaffirming what the members of the choirs are saying, that will speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that your word will enter into our hearts and do us good in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that through the word you will bless us and make us channels of blessings, that whatever you are telling us, will be good, profitable for our lives and profitable for the lives of people that have contact and interactions with us. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. We're looking forward to you blessing us mightily in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Want to open our Bibles to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. I'll read to you from verses 17 to... 27. And for my letters, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. In the passage we're studying, we're looking at Paul's exhortation to church elders. From the things we'll be reading, we've seen Paul the Apostle manifesting much love to the church by showing much care for the church sacrificing everything he had for the growth, the upliftment, the development of the church, and teaching the whole counsel of God. From the things we're reading about Paul, we're beginning to understand the roles of Christian ministers and Christian workers in the church. Church um, work demands a lot especially from the leaders in the church. From the things that Paul the Apostle emphasized, he emphasized his sacrifice, the service that he rendered more than the position that he held. In today's church, many parts of the world, the emphasis is on the position that we hold. An apostle, a pastor, a Sunday school superintendent, a teacher, a zonal leader, a Christian worker. But in the life of Paul the Apostle, what interested him, what he checked up every time, was not, what's my position? What's my calling? Am I recognized in the position I hold? No. But the service he had for the church was the most important thing. In fact, you will see that Paul placed great emphasis on the necessity of giving an example to the church, backing up the exhortation that he had given to the church. And when you sum up all that we require in leadership, today in many parts of the world, 
they're crying for leaders and they're getting into trainings and seminars and whatever it is for the growth of the work in many parts of the world in the church and they're asking what do we need from leaders and you have many many qualifications given but the most important qualification you have from a leader is an example and Paul was that example to back up the exhortation that he had given to the people writing to Timothy a young minister he said in 1st Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12 let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation in charity in spirit in faith and in purity how do you do that till I come give attendance to reading make sure that you check in from the book of God from the Word of God keep on reading give attention much attention to reading the reading of the Word of God and after that when you have assimilated the Word of God taken in the Word of God benefited from the Word of God for your personal growth then give attention to exhortation and in the exhortation you must make sure that you are giving attention to doctrine reading first then you must give attention to exhortation building up the church and then make sure that you emphasize doctrine now it's very clear there that it is very very important for us to give out example example Paul the Apostle himself said follow me as I follow Christ he knew the uh, he knew the emphasis he knew the importance of example Jesus Christ said to his disciples have you seen what I've done to you I've done that to give you an example that you should go and do to other people like that as well and so then it's not the position we hold it's not the title we're called by it is the example we're able to show it is not even how great an exhortation we can give how powerful a message we can give to other people but it is the example we give as leaders as elders as workers in the church in Philippians chapter 4 verse 9 those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you and so you'll see that Paul the Apostle gave this great emphasis there was a link in his mind there was a link also in his um, communication of the message that doctrine must be linked up with the practical application of the message to feed the church his life explained his message those two things went together in service humility and sacrifice now he believed that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and that all scripture is profitable and therefore he preached all scripture he kept back nothing that was profitable unto the church and he tells us in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house he taught publicly then he taught privately personally from house to house so that with the individual approach he could reinforce what he had taught them publicly now Paul's exhortation to church elders I told you last week that in the New Testament church there were elders appointed ordained chosen in the church to do the work of the church that the bulk of the work of the church never rested in the pastor never rested in the apostle of course those apostles they were great they were mighty they had the mighty spirit of the Lord upon them and there, were, there is no doubt they could teach they could preach they could heal they could do a lot yet in the early church there were elders chosen and I told you last week there will be no point in choosing elders if those elders will not be recognized if they will not be respected if they have not be obedience and loyalty to them in the early church they chose them those elders those elders were chosen because they recognized the importance of the work they had to do and I told you that in our church here God has given us the privilege the opportunity of having a number of people work along with the pastor and that these people 
they have an important ministry in the church and their ministries must be recognized, respected, and we must be loyal to them. I want to remind you again, because of this important fact, and it's so important, I do not want you to miss it. The recognition of the work of the elders in the church. But remember I told you that elders in the church, in the early church, were not the people that were gray-headed, having many years of experience, I mean human, worldly, carnal experience. But there were people that have been recognized by the church and they have been selected and chosen to have some conspicuous part place in the work in the church. And I want to show you again that in the early church, those elders were chosen to cooperate and to assist and to help in the work of the church along with the pastors. Let me give you some references again. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church. Remember again, every church, singular. Elders, plural. Not the pastor alone. Elders in the church. And had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believe. Now you can see there that the elders were in the plural, and yet in a single church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and verse 17. And for my letters, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, plural, of the church, singular. Elders to serve along with the pastor in the church. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be accounted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now you can see very clearly here that these elders, they had responsibilities. Responsibilities of ruling. And that the elders that ruled well, they were to be observed. Which means then, it wasn't only the pastor that was involved with the ruling in the early church. It wasn't only the pastor that was involved in the administration, the organization of the early church. The elders that rule well. Well, if ruling is to be done at all, then it should be done well. Done properly. For the edification of members of the church. For the growth of the church. Never for um, intimidating the church, oppressing the church. Never for crippling the church, but for making the church grow. But the point is this, those elders, they had responsibilities. If the elders have no responsibility, if there's nothing they're doing, it's no use having them. And it says, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Of course, we've heard before that in the Bible we're told that he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, he gave some pastors and teachers for the building up the edification of the body of Christ. Now these elders, they also participated in that work of the Lord. They labored, they labored, that's work. Therefore they are workers. They are laborers in the vineyard. They labored in doctrine and in word. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Verse 5. For this cause let I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting and ordained elders in the plural in every city. City, singular, elders, plural. As I had appointed thee. Which means then, now you begin to see some pattern here, that some of those elders were chosen, not even by the apostle, but were chosen by Titus. The apostle had ordained Titus, recommended Titus, lifted him above the general congregation so that he could have a special ministry to the church. And now the apostle was telling Titus, saying, Titus, I ordained you. I chose you. And you are now sharp enough, understanding enough, intelligent enough. You have enough knowledge to be able to appoint elders in every city as I have appointed you. And then he gave him guidelines from verse 6 on to verse 9. 
on the types of people he could select. But that's not the point now. It's not the qualification we're looking at now. It's the fact that there were elders in the early church. In First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. The elders that are among you, I exhort. You see that? The elders that are among you, I exhort. Whom am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, you learn something from this verse. There were apostles. There were prophets. There were evangelists. There were pastors. There were teachers. And then Paul the apostle was saying, there were also elders. Apart from these special ministers of the gospel, there were elders. And whenever you add an apostle and then elders, you'll make a difference. If they're in the same church, the apostle will carry on an apostolic ministry with apostolic authority. Whenever you add pastors and elders, there'll be a difference. You have the pastor and then you have the elders. But then from what Peter is writing here, by inspiration of God, he calls himself also an elder. Which means there are times that even all the ministers in the church the pastor the evangelist the teacher everyone together with all the others the bishops and the deacons they could be referred to generally as elders and they could be respected as such and so he said the elders that are among you i exhort well then listen to me he said i am also an elder but then an elder that could teach and instruct and motivate and send and exhort other elders which means that in the eldership in the church there were elders that recognized another elder like Peter who also an, I'm an elder and yet I'm exhorting you I am teaching you so they recognized then that even though all those ministers could be called elders the apostle could be referred to as a special elder that had the authority the knowledge the responsibility to teach and exhort and motivate and encourage the other elders as well. Then he says, I'm also a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. Who was he talking to? Elders, verse 1. What were they to do? They were to feed the flock of God. With what? With the bread of life, or the word of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither has been lords over God's heritage. But being examples to the flock. Now there is a problem here. That Paul, that Peter the apostle, that he recognized in the churches at that time. And it could happen in the church today. He says... Never, never act as being lords over God's heritage. He was telling those elders. He was saying, now, elders, listen to me. Also, I'm an elder. But recognize that I lived with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, the shepherd, the great shepherd, he gave us an example of how to live, how to minister as an elder. He, he drew water. He poured the water in the bowl and he took a towel and wrapped himself and he washed our feet. And he said, you are elders, you are apostles, I have sent you. But have you seen the example I have given you? As I have done to you, so you must do to the members of the congregation. Then Peter must have reminded them there was a time that we were fighting among ourselves who is the greatest of all the apostles. I think, you know, if I were in the world at that time, I would have been happy to just be an apostle. And I wouldn't care whether I was number 12 or number 10. I wouldn't care just to be called an apostle and just to stay close to Jesus Christ and go with him everywhere. I think that is wonderful enough. But those people, they are not satisfied with that. They want to know, well, we've got to the highest. We're not just teachers, Sunday school teachers. 
We are not just pastors of some local assemblies. We are not just evangelists to declare, thus says the Lord, you return to the Lord. We are not just prophets to point to people, thus says the Lord. But we are now apostles, the head of them all. But they were not even satisfied of being, an apostle, of being apostles alone. They wanted to know who is the first apostle, the senior apostle, the supreme apostle. That's what they wanted to know. And Jesus called the little child and said, Apostles, listen. Each of you, you must be like this little child. Apart from that, you have seen me. I came from heaven, the very son of the living God. And I am among you as he that serveth. And that is what you are to do. He that will be greatest among you, let him be the least. And now Peter was sharing that with the elders, saying, Now elders, you recognize I'm also an elder. And this is my exhortation to you. This is what I'm telling you. That you will not be as lords over God's heritage. Aggressive and wicked. Almost like tyrants overruling the people as if you are a military ruler over the people. No, be among them as he that serveth. And be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders plural of the church. Singular. You know, consistently in the New Testament, you have um, you know, all these elders appearing in each of those churches. Is any sick among you? You know, if anybody is sick in our church here, little headache, little stomach problem, we just must see the pastor. I want to see the pastor. Why do you want to see the pastor? I have this a stomach ache. Well, that's something that um, our leaders, area leaders and zonal leaders, they can easily say to that, no, I must see the pastor. And while that one is talking, another one comes in and says, I must see the pastor now, I must see the pastor now. What's your problem? Well, I ate too much in the afternoon. I have this, uh, my belly is like there's a stone inside. I have constipation. Well, <laughs> the pastor doesn't have to see you on that. You can see the area. Even the house leader can deal with that. He is an elder too, in some respect. You go and see him. No, no, no. I must see the pastor for this constipation. We spoil the whole thing. You know what the Bible says, and if we're obedient to the Bible, it says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them, let them, still the elders, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall do what? If those elders pray for you, will you ever get healed? Answer me. According to the Bible, you'll get healed. But you know, you have a little sore, you're looking for the pastor. You have a little stomachache, you're looking for the pastor. You have a little problem in the house uh, where you're living, you're looking for the pastor. It wasn't like that in the New Testament. And by the grace of God, we're building up a New Testament church. And if any is sick among you, you'll call for the elders of the church. Your area leaders are there, your zonal leaders are there, the prayer warriors are there. And by the grace of God, as they pray, understand, the pastor is supporting them. The pastor is backing them up. The pastor is praying for them. And um, when they succeed, the pastor is happy because we're in unity together doing the work. When they fail, the pastor will be looking at why have they failed? What is the pastor still to do so as to help them so they can succeed more? And if you go to them, I believe that when they pray, you'll get healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, if the problem cannot be handled by them, they have prayed and they have helped, but they are not able to get through. Of course, you can see the pastor and the pastor will help. But it's very clear from the Bible, from the New Testament, that there were elders in the church. And in our church here, we have appointed coordinator, we have appointed zonal leaders, we have appointed area leaders and house fellowship leaders, and these are to be respected and recognized, and they are to be allowed to do their work. Now come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're reading from verse 20. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you 
and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 20, the Apostle Paul said, I've given you an example in my teaching. You have seen that as I've taught you, I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He taught them the word of God. He didn't miss out anything. Because he, had, he himself had said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. Profitable for doctrine. Profitable for reproof. Profitable for correction. Profitable for instruction. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly punished unto all good words. And so he said, I have taught you publicly and I have taught you from house to house. That is, I have taught you corporately in the congregation together. And I have given special attention to individuals in teaching those individuals from house to house. To reinforce, as I told you before, what had been taught publicly. And then he said, he has showed you, that's the example. And he has taught you, that's the exhortation. It must always go together. And um, Zona leaders, coordinator, area leaders, house fellowship leaders, elders in the church. If you want your teaching to be respected, if you want your word to be accepted, you must do two things. Number one, leave it out by example. I have showed you. Show the example. Live the life. Let your light so shine. Do what Paul told, the, uh, told the, the young minister Timothy, saying, Let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example unto the believers in word, in the things you teach, in your spirit, in your attitude, in your behavior, in everything that you do. Let your life be an example that the doctrines of the church can be read in your life. The pattern of the life of Christ can be read in your life. The good uh, grace, uh, gracious things of the Bible can be read in your life. He said, I have showed you. That's the example. I have taught you. That's the exhortation. Publicly. Let your life match your message publicly. In your relationship with other members of the church, as workers, as elders, let your life, your relationship with people, your behavior, your talking, your conversation, let it be an example, a bright, shining example. And many of you elders of the church, workers in the church, you are working in your places of work. You must know that you are there as an elder. That people will look at your life and they will say, well, his, uh, you know, his life is so different, his life is so challenging. His quietness, his humility, his discipline, his diligence in work, his honesty, it is superb. In fact, he will go the second mile every time in his place of work. He'll work without ever complaining. He's ever dutiful. Well, people will say, don't you know, he goes to deeper life. Not only that, he's one of their ministers. He's one of their leaders there. And that's why his life is just uh, an example of what they're teaching in that church. And that's what the Apostle Paul said, that I have showed you. And I was telling them so that they too can show the members of the congregation. And so you as a worker in the church, uh, your life. It must be an example to every other person. And then when you teach, when you teach, you must study the word of God before you teach. Now, you know, I was a teacher in, um, you know, in the secular schools, secondary, primary, HSC, uh, university, when I was still uh, working. But I'll never go to the class without getting prepared. I have to read through those things, get to the library, check up all those books, and uh, write my notes, and then I get before the class, and I'll be able to teach them. And um, in all my years of teaching, I threw myself open to those students. You could ask any question in the class, any question in the class. What we learned last year, what we learned just last month, what we're just learning today, I prepared myself to the point that you could ask any question on all that I've been teaching you when I was in school. And they knew they could do that. They could bring the, you know, their exam papers out and they could say, well, this one that uh, was done last session, what, how is it about? And we, right there, I'll not say, well, let's, let's see it, what will happen next uh, lesson. Right there, we look into it. Because I prepared my lessons and I came to the church and God has helped me to be a teacher in the church and I do the same thing. Well, you know, 
that you could ask questions from the Bible. And I prepare myself to the point that I could exhort, I could teach, I could encourage because I devote time to learning, learning the word of God so that I can teach effectively. And you leaders also, you elders also, it must be the same thing that you must get into the word of God get into the word of God and learn that word of God so that you will be able to teach convincingly and effectively. Look at Titus verse 9 holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now as an elder as a teacher in the church Zona leader, coordinator, house fellowship leader, area leader, visitation worker, pastor, preacher, whoever we are, you must hold fast the faithful word as you have been taught and you must be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially day of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped stopped with sound doctrine you must know what you stand upon you must know what the bible teaches and teach it convincingly and effectively come back to acts chapter 20 verse 21 the content of his message especially to sinners who had not known the lord Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He was telling these elders that the work will remain in their hands after he had gone. Because he was telling them that I know that ye all among whom have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. As he wrote in one of the epistles, he was the aged apostle. He knew that the time of going home was very near. Apart from that, he knew that he must have to suffer in Jerusalem for the gospel he preached. And he knew that he wasn't coming back to this uh, Ephesus again. That's why he called the elders of the church together and he said, The work is now in your hand. And the discussion that was important now wasn't who is going to be the leader among all the elders. That wasn't the important thing. The important thing is that was that every one of the elders, every one of them, let's stop talking about who is first, who is last, who is in the middle, who is second. Let us just understand that all those elders in the church, they are respected, they are recognized, and there is loyalty to them. And they are given their the chance to do the work they are supposed to do. All of them, instead of just ordering them, you are first, you are second, you are third, and you are last, he said, the work is in your hand. I've shown you the example. And I've taught you repentance toward God. And you know that any time I talk to those sinners and they come for the first time, we're talking repentance toward God. I'm leaving the work in your hand, do the same. And also I've taught faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm leaving the work in your hand, do the same. That's what he was telling them. And today, all of us, now in the church worldwide, not only here in Lagos, but all over the world, we must recognize that Paul the Apostle is a teacher, was a teacher to us, a teacher of the Gentiles. And now, as he called the elders together, he is instructing us as well, and he's telling us we must never miss out these two parts of the message. Number one, repentance. Number two, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And in times of this ignorance, God winked out, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That means that all men everywhere, in every nation, in every tribe, whenever we have opportunity to preach the gospel to people, we must tell them that God requires sinners to repent. There are preachers today that are telling people that they don't need to repent. All they need to do is just accept Jesus Christ and they'll be saved. They don't need to repent. They don't need to turn away from sin. They don't need to have any change at all. All they needed to do was just to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tell them that the only sin the most grievous sin, the most terrible sin, is that they have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that's all that God wants. But no. The apostle here said, All this time, the time of ignorance, God winked at. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Sinners must repent before they can be saved. In Luke chapter 24 Luke chapter 24 verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem here was Jesus Christ himself talking to his own apostles and disciples and telling them that repentance, turning away from sin, must be preached in all nations, among all nations. And they must begin at Jerusalem. And so we also must understand that when we have opportunities to declare the word of the law to sinners, there must be repentance before they can be saved. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards world, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the verse that we're referring to with Paul the Apostle, he mentioned repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. There must be faith as well. Look at what Jesus Christ himself said in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 14 and verse 15 now after that John was put in prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel repentance first then believe in the gospel Believing that Jesus died for the sinner. Believing that whosoever will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Believing that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so then there must be repentance and there must be faith in Christ. Turning away from sin from all sin and telling the Lord you are so sorry for all the evil things you have done you know believe that Jesus Christ died for you and there will be salvation the joy of salvation will be in you there will be that evidence within you the witness of the spirit of God with your spirit that you are born again come back to Acts chapter 20 from verse 22 we we'll have seen the content of the message repentance and faith now, the consecration of the minister. Now, when we say that there are elders in the church, it carries a great responsibility along with it. And you can, not, you can never prove that you are called to be an elder in the church, a worker in the church, if there is uh, no sacrifice going along with it, if there is no consecration going along with it. Because the elders in the early church, the ministers in the early church, the workers in the early church, they were not uh, people that just came to occupy a seat, a throne, a position. They were people that came to serve. And Paul the Apostle himself said, I did it in all humility. I did it with many tears. I did it with many temptations and trials that befell me. It was a life of sacrifice. And it is still the same today. Now that's why you see that this um, church, uh, there is a difference between this church and other places. Sometimes, um, you know, people come into our church and they say the church is so large. And they tell us that there have been elders in their churches, where they're coming from. And now they, they wonder if they can do anything in the church. Of course, yes. There's such, there is a lot to do. There's a lot to do. I can begin to tell you some things that the Lord wants this church to do that we have not even started at all, at all. Much, much, much work that the Lord wants this church to do that we have not started at all. 
and I could branch off and talk to you one whole hour and just go from number one to number two to number three of the things that the Lord has for this church, the things that we ought to do that we have not even touched. We have not touched at all. You know why? Because there is a lot we're doing that we have not perfected. And the Lord is just waiting for us to get this done and get this done and get this done so that the next thing we can just go into it and um, it's fantastic and it is, it's great. It's heavy. And so people come to our church and they say, well, is there anything for me to do? Of course, yes. Now already you've done so much. much I, I, do you think I can have anything done? Of course, yes. And you're saying, well, I'm an elder in my church. Can I become an elder in this church? Of course, yes. But listen to me. The elders in those other churches, you know what they do? They attend committee meetings. They drink tea during that committee meeting and drink Maltex and drink Fanta. And some of them, they wouldn't mind bottles of beer during the time the elders are meeting. They wouldn't mind at all, at all. Are you hearing me? Now, it's just to go and enjoy elders of the church. And we say now the elders, the executive committee, the parochial committee, the progressive committee, the successful committee, the church work committee, they are all coming together and they are going to have a meeting and you can tell they want to go and eat. Now, if you've been an elder like that, no sweat, no sacrifice, no tears, no uh, real hard work with discipline and diligence. And you come to a church like this and you say, can I be an elder? Of course, yes, but not like that one. There's no tea. There's no maltex. There's no beer. Are you hearing me? If you want to really work, there is work. Hard work. And praise the Lord, you can do it. It may take you two months before you get started. It may take you even a year before you learn everything you ought to learn to be put into that position. But by the grace of God, you will do it in Jesus' name. Amen. But make up your mind. Because there is consecration necessary. There is sacrifice necessary if we're going to do the work in the church. Now look at the sacrifice, the consecration of this minister. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. From verse 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now you see, the ministry was number one in Paul's life. The work, the course given to him, it was number one in his life. Every other thing came second. Look at Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work, do the work, in the case of Timothy, of an evangelist, in your case of an elder, in your case of an area leader, in your case of a member of the choir, do the work, whatever the work is, it's going to take time. It's going to take you plowing and just plunging all your talents into the work. Do the work. It may be visitation. Do the work. It may be having to go out into those villages and tell them, hear the word of the Lord as, a, as an evangelist to the rural areas. Do the work. It, you know, the work in the New Testament church is not for those who are flabby. It's not for those who are psychedelic. It's not for those who are lazy. It's not for those who fear hard work. What want is to just be called by a name. It is work. Work. Hard work. You know, in uh, many, many places, they feel that church work is just enjoyment. That you can do church work and sleep a lot. Church work and fold your hand. Church work, do church work and just uh, eat and eat and eat. But the church 
of the New Testament has work for only the people that are diligent. The people that do not care about wanting to relax, about wanting to rest. The people that are willing to plunge everything they have into the world. They do it wholeheartedly. They do it diligently until they may even die on that job. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. There will be afflictions together with it. Rebuke together with that word. Now, you look at our washers here. As they stand over there to control traffic, it's hard work. Hard work. And without consecration, you can't do it. You look at these socials that are standing uh, in the church every time. And they just keep standing there, just keep directing people. It's hard work. Look at those members of the choir that play the instruments. Now it will look a simple thing to you. It's hard work. Because some of them pass, maybe they have left school for some time. And uh, learning those notes is hard work. Because you have to learn those things. Some of those things you have to learn by memory. Some of those things you just have to be sharp and see the, uh, see the notes and recognize this is what it means. A lot of things to learn. A lot of things to learn. And then practicing day and night. Practicing day and night. It is hard work. And of course, if you are going to serve the Lord, you must do the work. And we have a tip ministry. It's work. We have those who are working at the press for the church. It is work. And we have those area leaders that just have to bring all those reports. And those fellowship leaders have to bring those reports. It is work. Some of them will say, well, I'll just preach alone. Just preaching alone. Preaching to the house fellowship. I cannot feel the report. Uh-uh. You have to get everything together. But I don't know how to feel the report. You go and learn it and do affliction. It's going to be affliction. For you to now sit down, for somebody to tell you how to fill that report, how to, how to make your handwriting better, how to get everything done, age is work. And you know every time we bring all those workers together on Saturday, it affects their traveling out. Because the people that want to travel, if they are workers in the church, it's not easy to just travel away and travel away and just go and enjoy. They must come back before Saturday and they must be here to attend the workers' meeting. It is work. And without sacrifice, without consecration, you cannot do it. You cannot do it. But I'm believing God that more of us will do it in Jesus' name. And uh, this work, we're all going to do it. And I'm looking at some of our sisters. You have just started coming. You're used to even these benches who are sitting on they're too hard for you. You better endure that because I'm looking at you. You are going you are soon going to become a worker. If you cannot sit on the hard bench, when you become a worker, what will you do? Hard work is coming. I said hard work is coming. And we're all going to do it in Jesus' name. Not only the Apostle Paul, not only Timothy, not only Titus, not only Simeon, not only all these people, but you, every one of us, we're going to do the work of the Lord. But it's going to take some sweating. Are you ready to sweat? It's going to take some sacrifice. Are you ready to sacrifice? Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work. Do the work. The work of an evangelist, the work of an elder, the word of the work of a preacher, the work of a zonal leader, the work of a coordinator, the work of a house fellowship leader, the work of this station. Do the work and make full proof of thy ministry. Look at him in verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Look at a man talking about death as if he's just going on a journey. As if he's just going to Ayobo, the diabetes is saying, I'm ready now to depart. I'm ready now to move out. This was a great man of God. And I'm praying the same consecration, the same sacrifice, God will put in every one of us in Jesus' name. He said in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. Working for the Lord is a fight. A good fight. Because, uh, number one, you'll fight with your own laziness. I, I refer to these members of the choir. They have to fight with the um, laziness of the hand, the laziness of the brain. Because they'll play that thing and play that thing over and over, and the teacher will be saying, no, that, that's not the sound, that's not the sound, you missed it. And he'll try and try. He can be on that single note, that single key for a long time. And it's a fight. Fighting your laziness, fighting your indolence, 
fighting your uh, the the uh, the body that is so weak fighting and then fighting the opposition because your neighbors are going to tell you uh -uh, every time you go you go on monday you go on tuesday you go on wednesday you go on thursday you go on saturday you go on sunday how about it you are going to fight that idea they're going to tell you are you not doing too much you say no jesus christ did so much for me he went to the cross of calvary and i'm going to do so much for him anything that it requires and paul the apostle said i have fought a good fight I have finished my course. Have you started before you can finish? Have you started it? Are you a worker already? Or because uh, somebody just uh, spoke to you roughly in the house fellowship, say, no, I will not do that work again. Whose work? You are neglecting the work of your father because somebody spoke to you roughly. Or you say, because somebody did not treat me well, I will not do that work. Do you know what you are doing? You are forsaking the work of the master, the work of the Lord, the work of the father, because of somebody that offended you. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my cause. Do you know that God has something for you to do in this church? You are saved, you are a child of God, and you have started coming, and he wants you to evangelize. He wants you to talk to other people about the grace of God that saves, that redeems, and you are keeping quiet. And you say, well, I cannot do that because the Zona leader said this. That's part of the affliction you are to endure. The Zona leader may push you this way. I hope they don't push you too much. But sometimes they will push you this way and push you that way. You dare not say, I will not do the work because the Zona leader said this or somebody said this. That is part of the affliction you are going to endure. And keep on until you finish your course. And he said, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. I'm praying that you will not lose your reward in Jesus' name. Amen. But sacrifice, sacrifice, consecration. Look at Second Samuel chapter 24. From verse 18, and God came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aaron, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aaron looked and saw the king and the his servants coming on toward him. And Aaron went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aaron said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. There is a plague on the people of this world. And God is expecting you to raise up an altar. God is expecting you to raise up the banner. God is expecting you to raise up your voice and tell the world Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus delivers, and Jesus will make anything that is crooked in their lives, make everything straight. The Lord is expecting you that you'll spend some time. You'll give yourself. You'll give your money. You'll give everything that you have, all your talent, to make sure that the plagues in the lives of people, the plagues is removed. The plagues are removed. The sins are removed. The difficulties are removed. God wants to use you as a person that will build an altar before the Lord. And through that, many, many people will be free from all their problems, all their sins, all their iniquities. But then David went there and he said, I've come to buy of thee a threshing floor so that the plague, worrying people, destroying people, that it can be stopped. And Aaron said unto David, let my Lord the king take and offer what seemeth good unto him? Behold, here be the oxen. For burnt sacrifice, and a threshing instrument, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Aaron as the king give unto the king. And Aaron said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Aaron said, David, you want to sacrifice to the Lord? I'll make it easy for you. I'll make it so easy for you so that there will be no sweat. There will be no labor. There will be no cost. You wouldn't have to pay anything. You will just make the sacrifice to the Lord the easiest you have ever done. And David said, not me. 
not me, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offering unto the Lord my God of that that does cost me nothing. I, I won't like to give cheap labor. Something that doesn't make sweat come out of me. Something that doesn't tax me. Something that doesn't discipline me. Something that doesn't take real life out of me. I'll not offer that to the Lord. I will offer to the Lord that which costs me something. Your service to the Lord, does it cost you anything? Well, I invite people to the church whenever we are coming on Sunday. Well, does that cost you anything? You're already dressing up, just saying, uh, so and so, remember today is a church service, let us go. What does that cost you? But something that costs you, costs you money, costs you time, costs you even perhaps your profession. So as to be able to save the people that are lost, that you'll say, I will not, uh, I will not go to another city just because I want to remain here and do the work of the Lord. I'm a zonal leader. And uh, my company wants to transform me to Kaduna, wants to transform me to Portacot. I will not go, even if I lose that job, because of the work I am doing in this place. That's sacrifice. That's sacrifice. I'm a member of the choir. I could easily have gone over there, go to study. I could go to do this. I will not. I'm going to stay on this job. It will cost me something. But I'm going to offer to the Lord that which costs me something. And then there are other people that they might be called. And they might say, well, hey, don't you think that uh, this church you are going, you go every time, you go every time. How about overtime? And the money you'll get from the overtime is greater than the ordinary salary you are getting. Oh, I'm sorry, I cannot take it. What do you mean? Don't you need more money? Well, if I could get it without losing my place in the church, if I could get it without losing my work in the church, if I could get it without losing the opportunity of stopping the plagues in the lives of people, I'll take it. But if it will take the work of God away from my hand, I'll never take it. I'll never take it. The extra money, the extra pay, I lose it. That's the cost. The work of God costing you something, costing you your life. And coming like David saying, I want to offer to the Lord what will cost me something. What does the work of God cost you? And we step on your toes while you're doing the work of God. And see you continue doing that work? Can you receive a rebuke when you're doing the work and still continue the work? Let the work of God cost you something. And come to the Lord and say, Lord, you sacrificed your life, your blood, everything that you have. On the cross of Calvary, so as to redeem a wretched sinner like I am. And I give the rest of my life to you. Now that I'm saved, I'm going to do everything possible so that... Other people will be saved. Remember, my brother, my sister, you have only one life to live. Only one life to live. Any good thing that you can do, it's now you are going to do it. Any good work you can do, it's now you are going to do it. Any service you are going to render for this church, for humanity, so that there will be a way, they will be drawn away from the hands of the devil, and they will be saved. Any service you can render, it is now. Now, there are many of us sitting here. Uh, this church, we're looking for a lot of things. We need land, for example. And any service you can render, it may cost you time, it may cost you your, uh, your, your sitting in the office or your private work, and you're going on about looking for land for the church. Anything you can do so that the many, many people that are still in the hands of the devil, they'll be withdrawn from the hands of the devil, you will do it. And then at last you'll be able to say, I fought it out. You won't ever do any work for them without fighting it out. I fought it out. I fought a good fight. And thank God he did it and he finished. And we can do it in Jesus' name. We are going to do it in Jesus' name. Offer to the Lord something that will cost you something. Offer to it may cost you conveniences, cost you luxury, cost you your very life, cost you resources, cost you money, cost you your very life in this world. But be happy that I'm offering something to the Lord, even though it may cost me my very blood. I'm rescuing people that are perishing. Let's rise up. And you promise the Lord. And you consecrate yourself to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'll offer it. I'll offer it. I'll offer it. My life. My time. My resources. All that I have. I am going to work for the Lord in this church. We need you. We're waiting for you. The Lord needs you. Your service. Your time. Your knowledge. It's going to take hard work. But promise the Lord, oh Lord, I will. Oh Lord, I will. Oh Lord, I will. 
evangelize. Talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Bring them to the church. Let them be saved. Let them come out of the hands of the devil. It will cost you time. It will cost you money. It will cost you your life. It will cost everything. But do it. Do the work. Do the work. Do the work. The work of the Lord. Sacrifice and consecrate. Sacrifice and consecrate. Give whatever it will take. Give whatever it will take. There is much to do for the Lord. And the Lord has been waiting for you. The Lord has been waiting for you. The Lord has been waiting for you. Consecrate yourself to the Lord. And be ready for hard work. Ready for sacrifice. Ready for consecration. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord your God. A lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Snatch them. Snatch them. They are dying. Strike down them from the grave. Bring them to the Lord. Jesus died for them. Whether you ask fellowship or not, preach the gospel. Tell the loss of the Savior. Tell them Jesus died for them. Bring them to the Lord. It will cost you time. It will cost you a lot. But do it. Do it. Do it. Let all laziness go out of your bones, out of your body, out of your brain. And work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. What are you doing for the Lord? Does it cost you time? Does it cost you sweat? Does it cost you money? Is it more important than even your regular job? Do the work. Do the work. 